What up, ladies and gentlemen? Jesse Warden here. Quick update. I am participating in the Advent of Code 2020, and I wanted to show you what I'm doing this year. I was actually planning on doing Elm Lang for the third year in a row, but my kid convinced me to do Roblox. And if you're not aware, Roblox is a game very similar to Minecraft, where you play these games online, and it's very similar to Minecraft in that there's a bunch of different mods and different games that people make. But one thing it comes with is Roblox Studio. And Roblox Studio is actually an IDE to build these games. And so if you're familiar with other IDEs and programming environments and 3D editing environments like 3D Studio Max and Maya and things like that, you can you know edit models and, and see your world and, and modify geometry, et cetera. But from a coding perspective, you can code it in Lua. So unlike Minecraft, which has Java and is very OOP-centric and Java-centric, there's tools nowadays that have abstracted it away, but it took a while, right? From Roblox's perspective, they've got Lua day one in here, and they've got some interesting modifications to Lua. So if you know Lua, you already have a head start. I know Lua from my Corona days, but I don't know 3D. <laughs> and I certainly don't know coroutines very well. So this has been challenging. So I wanted to give a heads up. I've completed day one and day two. And I'll post the code for this stuff on day three. But I wanted to point out some of the things I learned on just Roblox in general. I, I thought it was interesting. Um, the first thing is that all these things that you see, all this geometry, like these buttons that I made and stuff, they're all static assets. If you look at this workspace off to the right here, you can see all the things that exist in the world. Now You can dynamically create any of this stuff with code. And you can remove it as well. And there's a lot of tools that kids use, my daughters in particular, to play with their friends in this IDE and build a world while they're using the tools. So like, for example, if I shared this game right now, you could actually come work with me and, and play with the code and see the same explorer I do in Roblox Studio, but we'd still be in the same game. And there's no source control. There's only a few undos, right? And if you publish it, you kind of get force push your changes. So it's it's absolute chaos. But what's interesting is that social aspect of being able to code together and create together. Um, and there's plugins that actually do that for people who just don't want to run Roblox Studio. But what I find interesting is that, like I said, these things can all be created, but sometimes it's easier just to create them yourself, right? To create these parts and give them names and then you can literally target everything with code. So if you're familiar with Director or Flash or Unity where you have object models that you can target with code paths, it's the same thing. And I've even brought in my Lua FP library, which is a functional library, but it is a script that has a child script. So like if I open this up and see the Lua code here, this is very similar to like JavaScript's, you know, export or Python's, um, you know, which is kind of like an applied export. Where in Lua, I kind of just do the module revealing pattern, I guess it's called. But either way, like even though these scripts are here, the script object is a global pointing to the file it's in. Kind of like, kind of like think like this, but for the module. And then it recognizes that this is the child of it. So if I go to mo maybe, and I have all the code to, you know, provide the maybe data type. Um, it exports a module, right? Very similar to when you do module exports in JavaScript or just Python, it's just, you know, public, but it's actually like a child of the script. It's so, it's so weird. Um, but anyway, so the buttons are, are what I wanted to really talk about that and the coroutines. The first is I, I had this day one challenge one and two and day two challenge, and it was so fast that you couldn't really see it. And that's generally okay for people doing, you know, Python and Go, but in Roblox and Elm, like you want to show, you know, your, your challenges, right? Because it's a visual tool. And so for now, the only thing I could think to do was slow it down. And what I found out is that they run these challenges, so the day one and day two, in coroutines. And coroutines are, if you're a JavaScript developer, think like a generator function where you can yield. In Python, it's very similar to their coroutines and async await. And so if I write like this wait command, if you think of like sleep in Python, for example, it'll wait. But what's interesting is it's, it's a, um, I forget the word, it's either preemptive multitasking. So like think like Elixir or Erlang where it gives you a set timeout and then your code stops. This feels more like cooperative, like Go, where you do as much work as you can and then you intentionally wait. 
and then they'll resume you at some point in the future. So you can actually do coroutine yield. But anyway, I've slowed my for loops and maps and um, things like that down. It feels really weird to do uh, functional reduce and then like pause in the middle of it. <laughs> like it's very strange. But I've done this. You can actually see the algorithm as it happens. So I kind of like slowed the code down on purpose. And I, I think I'm going to continue to use this technique. So in future challenges where they want you to create you know, visual stuff like maps and tiles and things like that, that I can use that to draw them so you don't see like 50,000, you know, boxes appear at the same time, right? You see like one appear after the other. So let me play this here. You can run it if you want, but I'm going to actually play my own game from my local host. I want to show you uh, why that's cool. So you can see the algorithm go, but even more importantly, because it's waiting, you can actually run both those for loops at the same time. So let me get rid of this terrain here. And I'll just, um, usually you can, you know, walk, but I'm going to zoom all the way into the character so we have first person view. And so when I click run slow, it's going to tell that thing to run the pause with seconds. If I say run, it's just going to, you know, instantaneously run the code. Very similar to if you were running in Go or Python or, you know, you didn't have any pausing, right? So when I hit run, it's going to run through all those numbers that you have to parse, add them together and find out which two equal 2020 and then show you the result. So for me, it's 2.11 and 18.09. You multiply them together and you get that result, right? So if you run normally, like you say, uh, let me zoom out just a little bit here. If you were to hit run, it's instantaneous, right? So I'll clear it again and run. But if you run slow, you can actually then run the second one too. So I now have two for loops running at the same time, which is, it's not really concurrency. It's more like, parallelism or is it the reverse i was gonna be confused but anyway they're like they're kind of running at the same time lua has got its own you know thread sequencer so if you think of like you know every frame when they redraw things they handle which lua coroutine gets resumed so anyway i thought that was kind of neat because i don't i know how to do multi-threading in like uh, python and javascript but i'm still learning coroutines and the coroutines that roblox has implemented basically is on you from a variety of levels. Either you can use wait and spawn, which they recommend not to, but it's, it's okay to learn, right? And then you can use coroutines yourself. Um, and then I found there's actually a variety of promise libraries that take into account that and handle error handling for you. So it doesn't crash <laughs> because error handling in Lua is kind of strange. It's kind of like a hybrid of Go where you can use protected calls if you want. But anyway, so that's day one and day two, where you, you're you adding the numbers, multiplying the result, and you can see it um, in real time. And what's cool is that these buttons run that, that algorithm. So these buttons target this script in the hierarchy. So if you want to see how that works, which I just, I didn't realize it was that easy. It, you know, it took a while to map my um, mind around. But if you say run, this button has a click detector, detector in it. <laughs> So I, I had to manually add that by clicking here. Then I go to the script in the click detector and it knows to look on its parent for the click detector's mouse click. So the script knows that his parent is a click detector and he has a mouse click event. And if you see this colon, that's like, you know, self or bind in JavaScript, for example, it guarantees that you have a self variable. So when I do that event, every time I click on the button, it'll run this. And so I can create a promise. And if it's not there, these promises actually come with cancellations. So if you think like Folktale version two, which has tasks, which are like cancelable promises, they they have these ability to prom, um, cancel the promises. And because a lot of these things are kind of like the saga pattern where like it pauses your code, it's nice because you can detect if your promise is paused. So if I go to the puzzle, for example, Notice I create a new promise, very similar to JavaScript, but it has it on cancel, so it's not just reject. And you can choose what you do. For now, I just have a state variable internally, and at any point, I can just abort the promise, right? Whether I'm in a for loop at the beginning, that's kind of up to you to determine what the state is. And Roblox is really good, uh, from what I've read, about removing click handlers and things like that from destroyed geometry. So if I were to destroy like this dynamically or create things and then add click handlers, they would you know handle the memory leaks. It's not like um, RxJS where you have to have a handle to the subscription. But anyway, I thought that was really neat that you can create buttons and then you just like duplicate these things 
right? And then you just rename them. You can even have the same name, but I'm trying to stay organized. And you just attach scripts to them and target things. Like, so I, I could target the text label and say text. Um, the challenge I'm running into, and this is where I need something like either the entity component system pattern frameworks that are out there or some hybrid of Redux, <laughs> right? Something is that there's no way to know what one thing is doing unless you intentionally create state. And so for example, this runs slow. I can't click run while it's running. Otherwise it'll like start it and ignore it, right? Because this doesn't know about this thing's promise in it, right? I'd have to like set it as a global or use the mediator pattern. And so a lot of the OOP developers, that's what they do. They either use global if they're imperative people or they're OOP and they use like singletons, you know what I mean? Um, and that's just gross. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, this is really far and away from Elm where you have managed side effects. Um, so I'm trying to find a kind of like a Redux framework. The, the same woman who built the Promise Library also has Fabric. I'm looking into that. And then there's this Roho thing where you can actually like use Visual Studio Code to run. And I don't have to reload my game every time I'm writing my code. But anyway, so I'll post the changes to this code. It's gotten nasty because of stuff like this where I'll literally pause the code strictly for UI events. And there's no easy way to pause a for loop unless you do it in kind of an imperative way because you you have to have kind of iterative or asynchronous code, right? So I have to pause it in the for loop to give it the opportunity to update the UI. And I can change, you know, how that pause works. It could be instantaneous if we're just doing it fast or it could be wait like a few seconds right so i'm still trying to figure out how to map this kind of stuff to a functional programming style but i mean i have reduce right like 99 percent of the lua docs is using i pairs and pairs and for loops all over the place so at least i have some functional programming and some recursion but like yeah this is really weird to mix and match but anyway i was really excited that i got the buttons working and so some of the future puzzles they have for having a code is where they create stuff and do pathfinding. So I'm hoping I can start building some dynamic visualizations on these walls instead of just, you know, showing text. But now that I know how to do coroutines, I can actually run multiple of those things at the same time. Um, I'm just struggling, which is great in promises because you can keep the state there, right? You don't have to worry about state variables. I'm just struggling how to communicate between things without using global. So I'm, I'm trying to find a, uh, a Redux style library. Otherwise, I'll just use the event system and make a hybrid of RxJS, I guess. But anyway, so I'll, I'll save and post this code um, tomorrow. Day three is tomorrow. And they'll post a new challenge. I'll work on that and then post the code for it. But yeah, it's been fun, man. Because like I, I already know a little bit. I know Lua, right? From the Corona days. And Roblox Lua is like 90% you know, Lua you're used to with some modifications. Um, I've just had to learn all the geometry and the scoping and how they decide to do things and what is a what the heck is a part what's a material why do i need to have a click handler inside of something to click on it <laughs> like just weird weird stuff like that and like i don't know what to search for the search terms like some things just pull up nothing like if i say why like why are there no free roblox items for clothes but they appear in the texture thing on the left so i can you know dress my character up it's just Robux, Robux scams, like, you know, virtual currency scams. It's just ridiculous. This is crazy. It's absolute crazy. In, in Twitter, like, you know, if I need JavaScript help, I got it. But if I need Lua Roblox help, like, they're all nine and 10 year olds from the UK <laughs> who make YouTube videos. So it's uh, it's been fun. But anyway, if you don't know what Advent of Code is, they posted two code challenges a day. You can go to, what is it, adventofcode.com. And it's for my, where I'm at the time of this video, four hours until I can see challenge number three. So you do the first challenge, complete it, and then you get the second challenge and everybody's input is different. So although you have the same code problem, you're going to get a different result, right? So that way you can still collaborate with your friends, but they can't really, you know, cheat per se because your input's different. So anyway, definitely encourage you to check it out. Some people do it just to get better at a language they know. Others use it to learn a language. I already kind of know Lua, but I'm using it to learn Roblox just because my daughter always gets mad I don't code her games. So, and I've learned a lot. There's a lot of tools around it that are amazing. So that's uh, been expanding my brain. So anyway, I'll post the code tomorrow. Later.